Yes, Irene, good morning. Yes, yes, good morning. Good morning, yes. sir. Uko salama. Kabisa, kabisa, we are out. So, uh, so this is our first class. My name is Amir okay. Dan. And okay. I'm here to teach you advanced auditing and assurance. So have you ever met before, Irene? No, not, oh, not before. No. So somebody, somebody yeah. somebody. My first time. Uh, <laughs> working in uh, auditing and assurance uh, intermediate level. Maybe somewhere else. Okay, so. So the first thing that I want us to do is uh, just to have an understanding of what auditing entails. Huh? <clears throat> now, auditing is also known as the assurance uh, uh, function. Auditors can be engaged to undertake a number of uh, uh, services, uh, which are classified as either assurance and non-assurance uh, uh, services. So auditing, auditing itself, auditing itself is a, an activity. Auditing itself it is a, an activity. And this an activity has for the end product, which is the auditor's report. The end product of an auditor work is an auditor report. In a pocket, you need to have auditor report. In this audit report, auditor will be expressing an opinion. Auditor will be expressing an audit opinion. Audit opinion. Auditor will be expressing an auditor opinion. An audit opinion. This opinion can take a twofold. It can be either favorable opinion, a favorable audit opinion, or it can also be unfavorable audit opinion. Unfavorable audit opinion. So when the opinion is favorable, or is confirming that the financial statements uh, do reflect a true and fair view, and they have been prepared in accordance with the identified financial reporting framework. When the financial statements auditor provides a, a favorable opinion, it implies that they do not reflect a true and fair view. And in that case, they have also not been prepared in accordance with the identified financial reporting framework. So under favorable opinion, auditor issue what you call a qualified audit report. Our auditor will issue a qualified auditor report, a qualified auditor report, a qualified auditor report. Then now uh, when the opinion is favorable, the kind of report issued is a qualified, a qualified auditor report, qualified auditor report will be issued by the auditor. So this happens to be a, a good report. Uh, this is a bad report. This is a bad report. So all it opinion is based on the examination of the financial statements. All it examine the financial statements. All it examine the financial statements to be able to make that auditor opinion. In the process of examining the financial statements, Audit obtain what you call an audit. So you perform what you call audit procedures. Audit perform what you call audit procedures, either substantive procedures, uh, which are classified into two areas: the voting and verification procedures. These audit procedures enable auditor to obtain what you call an audit evidence. Auditor evidence enable auditor to obtain what you call an auditor evidence. Auditor evidence. So audit, audit evidence are the facts and the information which enables an auditor to express an auditor opinion. So this audit evidence needs to be sufficient and also appropriate. So you can see that um, audit has got uh, quite a number of uh, activities uh, which are integrated. So audit has got uh, certain steps uh, which you auditors will go through until the point where they're able to do it, draft an auditor. A report, draft an auditor report. So these are some of the areas that uh, we're going to have uh, a discussion in this particular class of advanced auditing and assurance. So we have an auditor who happens to be the professional accountant who is appointed by the management, so who is appointed by the shareholders of the company or the owners to be able to examine the financial statements which were prepared by the, by the directors, then report back to them 
via what you call it, an auditor report, auditor report. So, so, so we also have uh, other key players who we call the uh, regulator, who we call the regulators, the regulators audit and accountancy practice is normally regulated. The regulation applies at uh, two levels. Regulation applies at two levels, we shall be discussing them. We have what we call the international level regulations. International level uh, regulation, international level uh, regulation. At the international level regulation, we have a uh, accountancy body, accountancy body known as the IFSC, IFSC, the International Federation of Accounting Council, the International Federation of Accountancy Council. This body has got other subcommittee, which has the responsibility of developing and issuing a number of accounting and auditing standards. For example, you can what you call the IAASB, IAASB, that's the International Auditing Assurance Standard Board, and by the develop uh, auditing and assurance standards. We also have a body like um, the International Ethics Standard Board for Accountants, the International Ethics Standard Board for Accountants. This has the responsibility to develop a code of conduct that guides the uh, professionalism of practice. It could be the integrity principle, uh, objectivity principle, confidentiality, uh, etc. We also have another one which is called the it, uh, uh, sorry, International uh, Public Sector Accounting Standard Board. International Public Sector Accounting Standard Board. So we in a develop those accounting standards used in the public sector environment. Then we have uh, a body like uh, the International Accounting Standard Board. We might develop things like the uh, IFRS, IFRS, the IS, which are applied in the area of accountancy. Then the second level, we have the local level uh, regulation. We have the local level uh, regulation. The local level regulation of accountancy, the local level regulation of accountancy, number two. And number two here, uh, these are, are applied at the national level in terms of regulated accountancy and auditing practice, whereby to, we have bodies like uh, CASNEM, CASNEM that does the exam administration of the uh, qualifications of uh, accountants. We also have the Accountants Act, Accountants uh, Act, there are a number of, uh, of them, but you can make reference to Accountants Act 2008, Accountants Act 2015, Accountants Act 2020. The other one, we have a body like uh, ISPAC. ISPAC is the professional body, sir, locally here. It is a member of uh, IFSC. For that case, it represents the accountancy matters of the IFC locally in Kenya. We also have a body like a Register of Accountants Board, Register of Accountants Board, that tasks with the responsibility of issuing a professional practicing certificate to the aspiring uh, accountants. So all it's regulated at the international level and also the local level. So when we will be do, uh, doing our discussion, we shall be focusing on what you call the auditing standards auditing uh, standards, which are issued by these particular bodies uh, here, by these particular bodies uh, here. On the other hand, we have mentioned the auditor, who is a professional accountant. We have mentioned the regulators. We also have a very important person about it, the directors of the management, whose work is to prepare the financial uh, statements. So the financial statements are prepared by the directors of the management, and the financial statements needs to uh, reflect a true and fair view, a true and fair view. Then you also have the owners of the entity who are uh, put with them, the shareholders, the owners of the entity. So because of that trust aspect, we, they may not have our trust on the management as far as the credibility of the financial statement reporting is concerned, they will need the services of, a, of an auditor. They will need the services of an auditor. They also have uh, other users who want to make certain economic decisions. Other users want to make a certain economic decision regarding the financial uh, statements of information. So for that case, there is uh, a need to have an audit. 
So we may ask ourselves, why is this audit very important? The directors have prepared the financial statements. Why again, the company has to pay for money for another person to come and just examine and be able to express an opinion. So in certain jurisdiction, we know that uh, audit is done to meet uh, a legal requirement. Audit is normally done to meet uh, a legal requirement for, uh, for the case of the uh, public limited liability. Before the financial statements is made public, the law requires that the mass have been what? audited by an independent auditor. But there is a general reasons why an audit can be very vital. An audit can be very vital for any business. So there are three reasons. So one of the reasons why the need for an audit, the need for an audit, need for an audit, need for an audit, we have got three valid reasons, a need for an audit. So one, is because of what you call um, what you call remoteness, remoteness, uh, remoteness, remoteness, remoteness. So remoteness is normally determined based on time, based on time, based on distance, based on distance, based on distance, and uh, expertise, based on distance and uh, expertise. So these owners, there are many. They are different. Uh, uh, locations or different uh, regions, they may not have that time to be around, to be checking or monitoring the company on a day-to-day -day basis. For that case, they need somebody to be acting as a watchdog to monitoring the directors, to show that the directors are doing the right thing as far as they safeguard their assets is concerned, the timely uh, preparation of liable and complete information or accurate financial information. For that case, there will be a need of an auditor. The other one is an element of expertise. These owners are not uh, experts. For that case, it is someone who is uh, knowledgeable when it comes to the financial reporting matters. That's number one reason why audit is very important. Why we need an audit? Because the remoteness has been determined by time, distance, and expertise. Another number two is what we call um, consequences. Consequences. Uh, consequences. Yes, there is a, a consequence or an outcome or an impact. If one happens to rely on the financial statements produced by the directors, there is uh, that consequences. So to reduce maybe a failure or to reduce what we call the information risk, there is a need to employ an auditor so that at the end you are able to get a reliable what? information. A reliable information. Then the third reason why an audit is very vital is because what you call the complexity. 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 This is another reason why we need an audit. Complexity. The language under which the financial statements are normally prepared may not be well understood by these uh, users or the owners. Uh, majority of them are non-accountants, so they may not understand the accounting jargon. For that case, uh, we may call for an audit. We may call for an audit. So class, that's just a, an overview of what audit uh, normally entails. It's about uh, engaging the auditor to perform a number of auditor uh, procedures to obtain sufficient appropriate auditor evidence, which should form the basis of our drawing an auditor opinion, very important. And audit is a regulated word, a profession. We have a number of our stakeholders or the players that they have to ensure Kwamba, there is a appropriate framework under which an audit should be conducted so that at the end of it, auditors do or perform a good job. So I just want to take you through our syllabus um, uh, topics. The syllabus of topics. We have got uh, like 10 topics to cover the semester. 10 topics to cover the semester. So I'm going to take you through these uh, topic areas, uh, topic areas, so that you get yourself familiar with the topic areas that we ought to be covering at uh, this uh, semester. Uh, this semester. So as per the uh, syllabus, examiner is so much interested that uh, we get that knowledge as far as the principles, the theories, and the concept underlying uh, 
auditing and assurance is a, a concern. Examiner also wants us to be able to understand the legal and professional uh, framework under which an audit is normally conducted. At the same time, the examiner wants us to have that knowledge to be able to draft an auditor report, to be able to draft an auditor report, to be able to draft an auditor a report. Yes, at the end of it, we should be able to sit down and write an auditor report upon conducting the required auditor procedures, auditor procedures, auditor procedures. The other thing that audit, uh, examiner also expected to be on the know is the various international standards on auditing applied. International standards on auditing applied. Love beer, examiner wants us to be able to demonstrate our understanding when it comes to the assessment of what you call the quality control procedures to be applied by an auditor a firm. So which are the topic areas that uh, we are supposed to be covering? So our topic areas are topics areas. So we have topic one. So the topics, uh, topics, so topic one. So our topic one is uh, assurance and non-assurance payments. Assurance, assurance and Non-assurance engagement. Non-assurance engagement. Assurance and non-assurance engagement. This is our topic one. Assurance and non-assurance engagement. That's our topic one. Assurance and non-assurance engagement. So this topic, we are going to learn what is a, an assurance engagement. How does it differ from the non-assurance engagement? We're also going to look at uh, various uh, elements that underlays assurance and non-assurance engagement as per the relevant auditing assurance uh, standard. Then topic number two is audit framework and regulations. Audit framework and regulation, audit framework, uh, framework and uh, regulation or framework and uh, regulation. That's our topic two, or it's a framework and uh, uh, regulations, or framework and uh, regulations. So all it's normally conducted in two sets of environment. We have the legal environment, then the professional environment. So in this topic here, we shall be looking at uh, some few legal uh, uh, framework in relation to the conduct of, a, of an audit. And our focus will be on certain things like, uh, on certain things like what you call the auditor's uh, professional legal liability. Auditor's uh, professional legal liability on this uh, topic. Of course, in the previous uh, audit and assurance class, we were taught uh, a number of things as far as the legal environment is concerned. We cover things like appointment procedures of an auditor, the rights and duties of an auditor, the remuneration of an auditor, the removal of an auditor from the office, and also the auditor's professional liability. So here, our main emphasis area shall be on the professional auditor's liability under this topic uh, two. The topic three is a professional and ethical considerations. Professional, uh, professional and ethical, professional and ethical considerations. Professional and ethical considerations. Professional and ethical considerations. So this is now the professional environment that uh, regulates on how an audit is, uh, is uh, conducted. So this topic, we shall be looking at things like uh, the code of ethics for the professional accountants, the fundamental uh, principles, the fundamental principles, threats and uh, safeguards, the fundamental principles, threats and um, uh, safeguards. Then we check on certain uh, concepts and regulations uh, pertaining the practice of uh, accountancy. Yeah. The topic number four is management and practice. Management and practice. 
management, uh, management and uh, uh, practice of management and uh, the practice management and uh, a practice. So you are an auditor, you're doing a job, you should be able to know how do you manage your work, how do you manage that uh, a practice. So this topic focuses on certain areas, for example, the client acceptance of uh, procedures, which you need to know what are the procedures you need to follow when it comes to accepting the job from the, the client. Then you also have what are one way or one method of obtaining work from the client in a to the tendering, the tendering. So you need to be conversant in the tendering proced procedures. The factors to be considered at the point of attendance and evaluation. The other things that uh, we shall be learning also is about uh, auditor risk. So how do we manage uh, auditor risk during the, the practice? And lastly, maybe things to do with the documentation of the auditor evidence. Then topic five, topic five. Topic five, we shall be covering what you call audit evaluation and reviews. Audit uh, evaluation, audit evaluation, audit evaluation and uh, reviews. Audit evaluation and uh, reviews. Audit evaluation and uh, reviews. So before the auditor express an auditor opinion, they are required to undertake certain review as part of the audit finalization or conclusion uh, processes. So this topic, we shall be looking at uh, those areas uh, that uh, are normally reviewed as far as the financial uh, statements reporting is concerned. The next number six, the audit related assurance services. Number six, audit, uh, audit related, uh, related assurance services. Assurance uh, services. Audit related assurance uh, services. So this area, we shall be looking at uh, other aspects of our audit uh, related services, like a social audit, environmental audit uh, aspect, integrated accounting uh, processes, integrated accounting process, things do the IT systems or the IT control systems, it is in. Then topic seven, topic seven is a forensic accounting, a forensic accounting, forensic accounting, forensic accounting. So forensic accounting is an area of uh, specialization. That's an area of a specialization. In case there is a suspected uh, a fraud or the dispute involving uh, a parties, a forensic accountant who is a professional can be engaged to undertake an investigation. So this topic here, we shall be learning more on about uh, the stages of conducting a forensic investigation. When you've been hired or when you've been contracted to undertake a forensic investigation, where do you begin the exercise and how do you end that particular exercise? Then also get to know things like uh, areas of the forensic investigation, areas of the forensic investigation, uh, types of the forensic investigation, etc. Knowing the difference between forensic audit and a statutory audit and a statutory audit. So the other one, the other topic is uh, concluding and reporting. That's number eight. Topic eight, concluding, concluding, concluding and uh, uh, reporting. Concluding and uh, reporting. Concluding and reporting. So that's a topic whereby we shall be looking at things with the uh, auditor's report, auditor's uh, reports, auditor's report, various types of audit opinion, various types of audit opinion that can be expressed by the auditor. Then audit appear who are communicating are those persons who are responsible for governing the company, the directors are you need to know the matters of the communication between the auditor and those persons who have been given the responsibility of governing the entity. Then topic uh, nine, topic uh, nine, topic nine, topic nine is a uh, regulatory environment. Number nine, regulatory environment. Regulatory environment, regulatory environment, regulatory environment, 
regulatory environment. So then we shall be looking at uh, some of the few players who have uh, that mandate of regulating the audit, like the IFSC, the professional bodies are ATC. Then the last topic, topic 10. Topic 10, topic 10. Our topic 10 shall be what you call the contemporary issues and emerging trends. Contemporary. Contemporary. Uh, issues, contemporary issues and emerging trends. Contemporary issues and emerging trends. So here you look at those trends that are affecting the auditor, maybe framework, the auditor regulation, the IT uh, aspect of the audit, ETC. For example, what are the effects of the global pandemic? What are the effects of the global pandemic? on uh, accountancy and auditing. Yeah, so how does such kind of a pandemic affects the auditing our work? So you need to know the level of the preparation auditors are required to be able to put in place as far as the, the pandemics uh, on how they affect the auditor our work, on how they affect the auditor work. So class, those are the 10 topic areas which are our understanding as far as the passive this paper is concerned. The assurance and non-assurance engagement topic, audit framework and regulation, professional and ethical considerations, management and practice, audit evaluation and reviews, audit related assurance and services, forensic accounting, concluding and reporting, regulatory environment, then the last one, contemporary issues and emerging trends. Contemporary issues and emerging trends. So these are the topics, uh, Irene and Nancy, we are going to be tackling in this uh, uh, chapter. So our knowledge of our previous audit and assurance uh, uh, study is very helpful in uh, understanding advanced quality and assurance. Now, come on, maybe we may forgot his ideas. We shall be focusing on some of the critical areas as a way of just reminding ourselves on what all is all about. So, so, so before we even begin the topic one, there's something always like uh, introducing. Yes, I say Kwamba audit is a process, audit is a an activity that has got a number of uh, uh, steps which auditors uh, do follow right from the beginning to the end, to the point where they are responsible of doing what? Of writing an auditor report. So let's now get ourselves familiar with the stages of an audit. Before we begin the topic one, I'm just saving the introduction part. Not even the introduction, but just uh, an understanding of auditing and assurance. An understanding of auditing and assurance. So what are the uh, steps of audit steps or what you call uh, audit cycle? Auditor a cycle, auditor a cycle. So the steps of what you call auditor a cycle. So every audit work begins from stage number one, which is a engagement. In stage number one is what we call engagement term or stage. This engagement stage is also known as what? The client acceptance procedures. Client acceptance of procedures. Client acceptance of procedures. Client acceptance of procedures. procedures. The client acceptance of our procedures. So this is normally done in accordance with the ESA, ESA 210. Normally done in accordance with the ESA 210. So here, there are matters to be considered. Matters, uh, matters to be considered, to be considered prior, prior accepting your ritual. Prior accepting audit engagement, auditor engagement, prior accepting the auditor engagement. 
for I am accepting the auditor engagement. There are matters to be considered for accepting the auditor engagement. Yes, we've been appointed as an auditor to the things that you need to put into consideration before we say yes to the client whom you are accepting to be their auditor. Then we also have the procedures after accepting appointment. Procedures after accepting appointment. After accepting appointment. After accepting appointment. Procedures after accepting appointment. Procedures after accepting appointment. Like one, we have the communication with the previous auditor. Communication. Communication with the previous auditor. Communication with the previous auditor. The communication with the previous auditor. Another one, there is what we call engagement letter. The engagement letter. Letter. The engagement letter are uh, drafting. The engagement letter drafting. The engagement letter are uh, drafting. The engagement letter drafting. The engagement letter drafting. So those are the some of the key activities that happens for your state number one of the engagement so client acceptance of procedures. Then you have a number two stage. Number two stage is uh, obtaining, obtaining, obtaining an understanding, obtaining an understanding, obtaining an understanding of the client, of the client, of the client entity, entity, and its uh, environment. And it's an environment. Obtaining an understanding of the client entity and its an environment. So the knowledge of the client entity is so very important for the auditor. Before you begin auditing one, you must have a proper knowledge information as far as the nature of the client business is a, a concerned and also the understanding of the environment under which they do operate. So this done as for maybe the ESA. Uh, 310 okay. is a 310. Mm -hmm. The number three uh, proceeding is a uh, planning and audit. Planning and audit. Planning and audit. You're planning the audit work. You are planning the auditor work. In planning the audit work, auditors are guided by the ISA 300. ISA 300. The international standards of auditing. 300. Where well, you as an auditor, you will be required to uh, plan your work so that you can conduct the audit in the most effective and efficient manner. So that you perform the audit in the most efficient and effective manner. You have a clear direction. You have a clear guideline on how do you attain the identified objective, which is to express an auditor opinion and also be responsible in terms of the risk management, risk management. Then topic four, after that one is ascertaining. Ascertaining, ascertaining the client, the client, the client assistance, ascertain the client assistance, ascertain the client assistance. So there are two systems here. There is accounting system, there is a accounting uh, a system uh, which you produce the financial uh, statements. They have what you call the internal control system, the ICS, the internal control system. So as a auditor, your understanding of this particular system is very important. For example, how are the system designed? How do they operate? What are the various controls established in such kind of a, of a system? That knowledge is a paramount. Then, uh, topic of sorry, processor four, processor four, after certaining, process four, after certaining, process four, after certaining, we go to, so number four, number four, number five, we go to what's called performing, performing, performing compliance testing. Performing compliance or uh, testing, performing compliance or uh, testing, of what is known as the test of control. 
test of control, the test of, uh, of control, the test of control. So test of control, these are the tests performed on the system. We are performing those tests on the system to confirm are the controls in place. And if controls in place, are they effective detecting errors and fraud? Are those controls effective in detecting errors and fraud? Then number six is uh, performing, performing, performing substantive, substantive uh, procedures, performing substantive procedures, performing substantive procedures. The substantive procedures are also known as test of detail, uh, test of detail, the test of uh, detail, the test of uh, detail, the test of detail. So these tests are performed on the classes of transaction and balances. I perform the classes of the transaction and balances just to check are they accurate, are they valid and complete in all our aspects. We shall be discussing them in the course of our discussion. Then topic number seven, topic, sorry, not topic number seven, but uh, the process number seven is uh, conducting I want you to just say performing, performing, performing the final, the final, the final analytical, the final analytical uh, review procedures, review procedures, performing the final analytical review procedures, performing the final analytical review procedures. So analytical review procedures are part of the audit reasoning procedures, audit reasoning procedures. They enable auditor to be able to question any form of inconsistency of the audit evidence obtained by other methods, of the audit evidence obtained by other uh, methods. For example, auditor can perform ratio analysis, ratio analysis, ratio analysis, ratio analysis. And those ratio analysis can be used to gauge the performance of the entity Whereby you can compare, you can compare it with another a firm in the same industry to be able to tell any negative uh, trends. And that one will enable audit to obtain some good evidence that shall support their auditor opinion. The number eight, step number eight, after performing the final analytical review, there is what you call audit finalization. Audit finalization. Audit finalization. Or concluding an audit, or concluding an audit, or concluding an audit, or concluding an audit, or finalization, or concluding an audit. So this is whereby we end the auditor work by doing such a reviews. For example, we check on the going concern. We check on the going concern. Well, the financial assessment prepared based on this fundamental accounting assumption for the financial statements prepared on the, based on this uh, fundamental assumption. The other one, we also do what you call the subsequent events review. Subsequent, subsequent events are review. The sub subsequent events review for check whether the relevant accounting standards were duly followed. The other one, after that one, we also have what, uh, what you call the overall audit review. Overall audit reviews, overall auditor reviews, overall auditor reviews. So we also want to take the overall auditor review work. So then number nine, which is the last one, number nine, which is the last uh, process of an audit. Number nine is a drafting and signing an audit report. Uh, drafting and Signing an auditor report, drafting and signing an auditor report, drafting and signing an auditor report. It is the last stage of the audit. So you write the audit report where you express an auditor opinion, where you express an audit opinion. So, plus, those are the important uh, stages of an audit or the audit cycle. Uh, which forms a number of our activities undertaken by the auditor, right from the point of uh, engagement to where they finish the job, 
by making a report to the uh, to the owners as part of the statutory requirement, where auditors are required to make what a report. The law requires auditors to be able to make a report, and that report they should be able to express an opinion whether the financial statements do reflect a true and fair view, and whether it has been prepared in accordance with identified financial reporting and framework. So that's it, as far as the your part of the introduction is uh, concerned. So, so, so Irene and uh, Nancy, you have any question up to that point? Uh, Sasa, you, you are online, uh, physical here. Yes, Irene, any question up to that point? No question, sir. How is the flow? Is it audible enough? Yes, Nancy. Do you have any questions? Yes. Is it no, I don't have any. Yes, yes you're audible enough. Okay, so, so, so that's uh, the stages of an audit. I hope you're taking some short notes on these areas like this so that you get yourself familiar as far as the stages of an audit is uh, concerned. So, so I allow you to take some few minutes break. Then when we come back, before we begin the topic one, we understand various types of an audit, various types of an audit and the classification of an audit. So let's have some few minutes on a break. 10 minutes will do for a break. So let's now walk uh, through what we call uh, types and uh, classification. Types and classification of audits. Types and classification of audits. Types and classification of audits. So we have got uh, two main uh, categories of audits. As far as the types is concerned, types of audits, types of audits. There are two main types of audits. There are two main types of audits. There are two main types of audits. So we have what you call the external audit. External audit. The external audit. The external audit is further divided into two areas. It's further divided into two areas, whereby you have what you call the public, public stroke, non-statutory, uh, non-statutory audit, non-statutory audit. The public stroke, the non-statutory audit. Then you have what you call the private, private, uh, private stroke. Sorry, this should be public stroke, the statutory audit, statutory audit, the statutory audit, then you have the private stroke, the non statutory audit, non statutory audit, statutory audit. So then we have the internal audit. We have the internal audit. Internal audit. So there are two main types of audits. There are two main types of audits. There are two main types of audits. The external, the internal. The external is divided into the public or the statutory audit, and the private, the non statutory audit. So, external audits performed by an outsider who is an independent uh, contractor. This is performed by an independent contractor. 
independent term contractor, independent term a contractor, independent term a contractor. While the internal audit is performed by an employee, this is performed by an employee of the firm. An employee of the firm is one who is engaged to perform that audit, to perform the audit. The focus of the external audit work is normally on the financial statements. Auditor will be examining the financial statements, the historical financial statements that to check where they're free from any form of material misstatements. The focus of the internal audit work shall be on what you call the, the procedures, the procedures, the procedures and operational activities. The procedures and operational activities. It will be focusing on the procedures and operational activities to check. Are these activities and procedures efficient? Are they economical? Are they also being done in an effective manner and to give room for the recommendation for further improvement? So there's also the difference between external audit and internal audit. For example, this person here earns audit fee. Internal auditors, they are paid auditor fees. So external auditors are paid audit fees. While internal auditors, they do earn salaries. Be the employees, they do earn salaries and uh, our wages. They do earn salaries and, uh, and wages. This case here are appointed by the shareholders. The external auditors are normally appointed by shareholders. Appointed by uh, shareholders. They are appointed by the shareholders. They are appointed by the, the shareholders. External auditors are appointed by the, the shareholders. Why the internal auditors? Internal auditors are appointed by the management. They are appointed by the management. Appointed by the management. They are appointed by the management. They are appointed by the management. Internal auditors are appointed by the management. The other differences in terms of our reporting, external auditors, external auditor, they report to the manager. So they report to the shareholders, uh, report to the uh, shareholders. They report to the uh, shareholders. The external auditors, they report to the uh, shareholders. While internal auditors, they report to the management. They report, report to the management. They report to the management. Internal auditors report to the management. They report to the management. So the other one is in terms of the scope of the work, 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 the scope of the work. So the scope of the work of the internal auditors is determined by the management. So it is determined, determined by the company act. The company act and is us. So when it comes to the scope of the work, it's determined by the company's act and uh, is us. It's determined by the company's act and uh, is us. It's determined by the company's act and uh, is us. While the ex internal auditor, the scope of work, internal auditor, this is over, the scope of work is determined, determined, determined by the management, determined by the management. Is the managers which are determined what responsibility to be performed by the internal auditors. So the scope of work of the internal auditors is determined by the management. The scope of the work of the internal auditors is determined by the, by the management. If the managers will tell what roles, what responsibility, what procedures are to be performed by the internal Auditors. The other one is in terms of the liability of these auditors, liability, uh, liability, liability of these auditors. So external auditor, this liability goes to the company, uh, company, it is to the company and third parties also. Third parties, that means over the company can sue the auditor, 
and also third parties can also sue the auditor in the individual capacity in case of maybe negligences or any other liability matters. Then internal auditors, the liability is all limited to the company. So liability limited only to the company. Limited only to the company. Only to the company. The liability is limited only to the company. So the liability of the internal auditors is only limited to the company. It's only company that can sue that kind of an employee and not the third party, and not the third party, and not the third party. In terms of the work, in terms of auditors, the work is continuous, it's a continuous uh, throughout the accounting period. While the external auditor, their work only comes maybe towards the end of an accounting period, towards the end of an accounting period. In terms of uh, independency, external auditors are required to be independent, so they are required to be independent, while the internal auditors is not a must for them to be what? Independent, it's not a must for them to be independent. So then we have uh, these two other small audits here under the external audit, the public and the private. So this is done by, uh, both of them are done by the external auditor, both of them are done by the external auditor. This is done because of the legal requirements, the public audit is done for the legal requirements. This is just a voluntary audit. It's done at the express interest of the business owners who may request that these services be provided. The other one is uh, as far as the uh, document work is concerned, this one documents a public utility that alters the report is a public utility document. It's a public utility document. In this case here, it is not a public utility document. So a public utility uh, document. So, so plus those are the uh, main types of uh, audits. So we can have a discussion on the classification of audits. On the classification of audits. Uh, classification of audits. Uh, classification of audits. Classification of audits. Classification of audits. So the first classification, two point classification. Uh, classification. Classification according. According to the nature of work done. To the nature. Done to the nature of work done. Classification according to the nature of work done. So, so here, this one is in view. Right? Well, this uh, entails a uh, legality and the person, uh, legality and persons who perform them. The legality and the persons who perform them. So, this um, include one we have what you call the external audit. External audit, the external audit, then you have internal audit, internal audit, internal audit, internal audit, then you have the private audit or the public audit, uh, public audit, then you have what you call any private audit, the private audit, the private audit, the private audit. So this one is in terms of the legality. Uh, legality. Uh, this one's uh, uh, classified based on the part, the person who performed them. One an insider, another one outsider. Then you go to the second classification. Number two, classification of the audit. Classification of audits. The classification according, according, the classification according to the uh, audit timing, classification according to the auditor timing, classification according to the auditor and timing. So all the audit timing here is the period under which these audits are done. The period under which these types of audits are done, period, period when work is done, period when work is up is done. The period when the work is up is done, period when the work is done 
So here we have got three uh, categories of audits. One, we have what's called the interim audit, interim audit, interim audit, interim audit. So interim audit is one that's done uh, in, in certain regular time period, in certain regular time period, men for the company that are required to publish interim financial statements. So in that case, it is the interim financial statements, the ones being audited, the ones being audited. It's very useful when it comes to declaration of interim dividends, declaration of interim dividends, declaration of interim dividends. The number two, we have the continuous audit, continuous audit, continuous audit, continuous audit. So continuous audit one that's done, right from the beginning of the financial accounting period. It's ideal for the manufacturing concerns because of the nature of the transactions. These are quite many, the thousands and thousands of, of, of transactions. And we do not have enough time to audit all those transactions towards the end of the financial period. Now, all those transactions, if left unaudited for a long period of time, the errors of the fraud will be discovered at a very advanced stages where maybe lesser action can be taken. It's so ideal for banks, so it's so ideal for those organizations that operate in a very dynamic and risk environment, like banks, uh, insurance firms, where a continuous audit will be required. The number three, we have what we call the final audit, the final or complete, complete audit, the final or complete audit, the final or complete audit. So this is an audit that's performed towards the end of the accounting period. So our lines of it shall be on the interim and the continuous audit work. So that's the second transmission according to the uh, timing uh, period and with those particular audits are supposed to be uh, our next classification, next classification, number three, number three, we have classification, uh, classification, according, according to audit approaches, auditor approaches, classification according to auditor, approaches, classification according to audit approaches. So class, these are some kind of a partial audits. These are for some form of a partial audits, the partial audits, which are done to meet a specific uh, need or an objective. So examples here include what you call the procedural audit, procedural audit, procedural audits, procedural audits. So this way the procedures are being examined. This way the procedures are being what examined to check how efficient, how effective, how economical are those procedures being performed. Next, we have what we call the management audit, the management audit, the management audit. So this is done like a, an investigative audit to investigate the managers to find out if they are making good decisions, how effective are they as far as their performance is uh, concerned, as far as their performance is uh, concerned, the management of audits. The other one is how much for the operational audits, operational audits, operational audits, operational audits. Operational audits is done to check on the activities of the farm, whether they are efficient, so there's a base of what you call efficiency, 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 effectiveness, 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 and also to find out the economy of those activities. Are they efficient? Are they economical? Are they effective? So operational audit. Another type of an audit is what you call the balance sheet audit. A balance sheet audit, the balance sheet audit, the balance sheet audit, the balance sheet audit. The balance sheet audit is just kind of a, an approach whereby auditor begins the work by examining the balance sheet items, then going backward to the source document, tracing those trans, uh, those balances to the 
as source of a document. So we begin by auditing the balance sheet, assets, liability, and equity, then going backward to maybe income statement, the entire balance, back to the respective ledgers, up to the source of a document. Just to check if those transactions were correctly posted, were they complete in all aspects? Are they also audit? So the balance sheet are audit. So on the classification point of the audit approaches, we have the procedural audit, the management audits, the operational audits, then the balance sheet audit. Then we have number four classification. Uh, classification, uh, classification according, according to audit strategy. Auditor or strategy, especially according to auditor a strategy. So auditor can adopt a strategy as a means of auditing the client financial statements. So under this classification, there are three type, uh, types of audit. You have to call the voyaging based audit a strategy, the voyaging based audit, the voyaging based on audit, the voyaging based on audit. The number two, we have what we call the substantive, sorry, the system, the system based audit, the system based audit, the system based audit. And after number three, we have the risk based, the risk based on audit, the risk based on audit, the risk based on audit. So there are three categories of audits the voyaging, the system, the risk. So this audit are normally determined by what you call the nature of the ICS, internal control system, and risk. So this work will determine which strategy to be adopted by the auditor. If the system is weak, the auditor will go for the voting based system. So the voting based auditor strategy. If audit has done an assessment and he has found that the internal control system of the client is very weak. It doesn't have the effectiveness of detecting errors on the file. In that case, auditor shall go for what you call it the voting based on auditor strategy. Then system is when the system is very strong. When the ICS is very strong, it is effective in terms of detecting errors and fraud and having them be detected in a quick time. Auditor shall now place reliance on such kind of a system as a basis of what? Of conducting an audit. In that case, auditor shall go for what you call the system based auditor or strategy. The system based auditor or strategy. So, voting for the weaker system. At that case, what is going to increase the substantive procedures to be performed? It's going to do more so that to, uh, to increase the sample size to be able to reduce any chance of not detecting any form of material misstatements. Then the system based audit, audit is going to limit the procedures because already the system is a very effective, it has that capability of detecting errors and any fraud. So in this case, upon the sample size shall be reduced. Then you have the risk based audit. This one is uh, the most recommended nowadays uh, a strategy of auditing because there is a pressure by the client that auditors should reduce their audit fee. They should be able to keep their audit fee very low. So the client will prefer or to go for what you call the risk-based auditor approach or the strategy. In a PM, because there's a lot of uh, ICT systems. This ICT it may increase the level of auditor risk. It may increase the level of the auditor risk. So this kind of an approach upon it will enable auditor to reduce that risk, uh, to reduce that risk, the chance of giving inappropriate auditor. Okay, so this will be recommendable where there is a need to reduce the risk of material misstatements in the financial, sorry, to uh, focus on the risk of material misstatements in the financial statements. So as for the strategy, we have the three, fortune, uh, system, then the risk-based auditor uh, strategy. Then we have number five classification of audits, Number five, classification of audits. So number five, you have a classification. Classification according. Classification according to the organization structure. Classification according to the organization. Organization structures. 
classification according to the organization or structures. Classification according to the organization or structures. So this is uh, where I took on a discussion of the business components which have been segmented or which have been distributed in a certain manner. So here we can have what we call the branch audit. The branch audit, this applies for those businesses that are divided into branches. There are branches are spread in certain regions. So the branches can also be independently audited. We also have the group audit, the group audit for those companies that maintain consolidated accounts, for those companies that maintain consolidated accounts. Then we also have what you call the joint audit, the joint audits, the joint audits, the joint audits. So joint audits applies to those companies, those are the scenario whereby more than two audit firms, more than two audit firms. So not if you say more than two, it means more than two cannot no. More than one audit firm, more than one audit firm, like two or more audit firms coming together to perform one audit assignment and give up a joint auditor a report. For a situation where joint audit can be recommended, like uh, if the senior partner is in a foreign country, this is the partner is a local, a local country, they can work together. They can work together as a team and later produce a, a one audit report for the, for the client. So joint audit. Then the last classification of an audit, the last classification of an audit. The last classification of an audit. So we have the last classification of an audit. So we have classification according to societal needs, number six. Number six, classification according to the societal needs. Classification. Classification according, according to the societal needs. To the societal needs. To the societal needs. Classification according to the societal needs. Needs classification according to the societal needs. Classification according to the societal needs. So here, the society has got the needs that also needs to be met. They have got an interest of what is happening in the company as far as the corporate social responsibility activities is concerned. As far as the corporate social activities is concerned. So here, uh, we have an audit like what's called forensic audit. Forensic audits, forensic audits. We have forensic audits. So forensic audits are conducted when a fraud is detected and a forensic expert can be engaged to come and quantify the financial losses suffered by the entity. To quantify the financial losses suffered by the entity and give um, and give a report of some or some kind. And give a report of some kind. The next year we call the environmental audits. Environmental audits. Environmental audits. Environmental audits. Environmental audits. So this is normally done for the, for those companies where an environmental compliance reports will be required. Just to check whether the company has put in adequate measures for uh, protecting the environment, for, for, for protecting the environment. All those measures which they are put in place, how effective, how efficient are they as far as the environmental protection is concerned. That is, an environmental audit will be done. Now, in Kenya, the main primary user of environmental audit reports in Kwanini, the name the NEMA, National Environmental Management Authority, which will demand for an audit of the firm to be done to check whether they are complying with the various environmental laws and regulations are put up in place. Then we have what we call the social audits, social audits, the social audits, the social audits. So social audits, this is done to check whether the company is fulfilling their social obligation. For example, the certain part of their 
uh, profit, which they said in uh, meeting the society obligation. There's a form of scholarship for the bright and the needy uh, students in the community. It could be maybe they have been uh, put it uh, in a helping in poverty education. It could be in water, healthcare, etc. So such kind of activities needs to be audited to confirm the level of the transparency, accountability, how efficient, how effective a such kind of intervention uh, measures taken by by the company and directors. Are they trustworthy enough as far as the money yeah. they set aside for the social for the social activities or the pro the programs? So we can undertake a social audit, a social audit. And this tool sometimes is a commonly a community project, they normally take it together. And it's the part of what the social and environmental audits, the social and environmental audits, which is done to assess the impact of maybe a project too the livelihood of the people residing in a certain area. How positively is it impacting them? How negatively is it also maybe impacting them? Or even sometimes before a mega project is put in a certain place, uh, a social and environmental audit may be required. That is done and it can give them an okay whether that project can be, can be commenced or it cannot be commenced. So plus those are the various types of um, audits and the classification, which is very important for us to be able to, to know. So there's some that uh, we shall be discussing in our class when we begin uh, looking at our syllabus. Like forensic audit, there's a topic for that. Forensic accounting, there's a topic for that. Uh, environmental audit, we'll also be discussing them in a certain topic there, which is the audit for related services. We shall be discussing environmental audits and also the social, the social audits we shall be uh, discussing them. On this audits here, on this audits are uh, mentioned here, uh, voting system this audit, we shall be discussing them in a topic in the the management of an auditor practice, the management of an audit practice, we shall be discussing the voting of the system, the risk-based auditor approach. Like one of the areas that uh, you can't miss without being tested in this paper, you cannot miss being tested in this paper, is matter to do with what? The risk uh, uh, part. Because one of the factors affecting auditors, as far as their work is concerned, in a one of the risk, uh, the risk matter. So we expect for we shall be tested on the risk uh, area. So we shall be discussing more about uh, various uh, risks as far as the business risk and audit risk is a concern, and audit risk is a, a concern. We shall also be looking at uh, the audit procedures with regard to the branch audits, the branch audits, the group audits, the group audits, and also the joint, the joint uh, audits. The branch audits, the group audits, and also the joint uh, audits. So that's it as far as my introduction of um, Audit is concerned. Auditing is concerned. So next uh, discussion will be the assurance part. It to level what is uh, this assurance? What is this uh, assurance? What is this uh, assurance? So that means that we're going to begin now on topic one, which is assurance and non-assurance engagements. Topic one which is assurance and non-assurance engagement. Topic one, which is assurance and non-assurance engagement. Topic one, assurance and non-assurance engagement. Topic one, assurance and non-assurance engagement. Assurance and non assurance engagement. So, we are familiar with the word assurance. We are familiar with the word assurance. If you use the word assurance, it's like offering some guarantee to another person. Whatever information we are providing, it's a truthful. 
it is a credible. Or maybe we are going to take the blame in case something doesn't uh, happen as per what we have uh, said or what we have uh, committed ourselves. So in the area of auditing, auditors are expected to provide some level of assurance. This level of assurance is meant to enhance the degree of confidence of the users of the subject matter. Papa, yes, what we give you, you cannot doubt it because it has come from the hands of a, of a professional. Just like when you go to the hospital and you meet a qualified doctor and upon the diagnosis, the doctor give uh, the report. You're likely to trust that particular report because it is coming from a specialist who has got the knowledge in that uh, area. So also when the financial statements come from the hands of the auditor, it means over the award credible for that case, they enhances the degree of what confidence with, with regard to any economic decisions they're going to uh, make pertaining to the areas of our areas of our, of our interest. Hence that's why, hence that's why we are referring to as an audit as what an assurance uh, engagement and also other services underlaying the engagement uh, work that can be provided by the by the auditor. So you need to understand more about uh, assurance, uh, more about assurance. We do use uh, an analogy, an analogy, which is a kind of a, a story. It is a kind of a, a story. And this story helps us not understand why assurance services is quite very important. Why assurance services is quite very important. So let's assume that um, we have got these two parties who want one wants to buy a car. We have got these two parties who want to buy a car. So we have the seller or the dealer. We have the seller or the dealer. Who is in the business of selling the cars? Then we have the buyer. Who is a prospective client? Prospective client. Prospective client. Prospective buyer. A client, a prospective a client, he wants to buy the car. So there is a form of a, a transaction taking place here, and this transaction has to occur. It has a consideration. It has a consideration. It has a consideration. It has a, a consideration. It has a, a consideration. There is a money value. So this person is going to make money. This person is going to have a possession and ownership of the car. So there is a exchange of money for possession and ownership. So this buyer wants to make a purchase decision. And for that case, this guy needs uh, information. He needs uh, information, not just any form of information. He needs to have a credible information, a reliable information, an accurate information. Now here there is a, some information imbalances or what you call the information asymmetry. Information asymmetry. Information asymmetry. Information asymmetry is whereby one party has got more information as compared to the other person. One party has got more information as compared to the other person. This dealer is a person who has been having experience. He's so much exposed when it comes to the the car conditions. She has got uh, good information where this particular car is of good value. It's going to serve this person. And this person will be very happy to have purchased uh, a good car from this particular car. So think of uh, there is some unfairness. One person has got more information as compared to the others. So in order for this person to reduce the risk of failure, to reduce what you call the information risk, this buyer up, for him to reduce the information risk, is going to engage as services of an independent party who can help him to make the right word, decision. And this part is called who? A mechanic. This part is called a, a mechanic. This part is called a, me a mechanic. A mechanic, these are some, no, not just any mechanic. These are qualified mechanic who is coming from a reputable uh, farm. So this mechanic will come and test the car and check whether everything is, up, is okay. And if he's convinced now, based on his level of knowledge, uh, expertise, and experience, 
he will provide information to the buyer whether to buy the car or not to buy the, the car. So the mechanic will review that car based on a certain criteria known to them and give uh, the valuable information to them, to the buyer, whether to buy the car or not to buy the car. So the buyer will be very much convinced. This uh, level of assurance will have been enhanced because uh, the information is coming from what? Independent uh, source. From somebody who is not under control of the bar, the buyer or the, deal, the dealer. Somebody cannot be compromised by the, by the seller or the, deal, the dealer. There is no any kind of a relationship between the uh, two here. The same also applies for quality, whereby the seller here symbolizes the directors. Directors or the responsible parties whose work is to prepare the financial statements. The buyer are the users of the financial statements. Are the users of the financial statements? Are the users of the financial statements? Then the mechanic here is now who the auditor or the questionnaire engaged by the by the owners of the firm to examine the subject matter and give them information. Then the car here represents what the subject matter. The subject matter, what are we examining? What are we reviewing? So that we're able to do it, make an opinion, make an opinion, express some an opinion. So all assurance engagement is just a form of an engagement where a professional accountant or a practitioner is engaged to review or examine a certain subject matter and express an opinion that can give some level of assurance, some level of assurance to the intended users, to the intended users, to the intended users. So, so this is what we're going to discuss next. So in assurance, out of the discussion, could have those elements of assurance, for those elements of assurance, engagement, like uh, we have the responsible party who makes the subject matter, we have the subject matter, we have the intended users who are in the position of the client or the buyer, we have the auditor who is the practitioner, we have the opinion from the reports, we have the opinion from the reports, we have the entire engagement uh, process, uh, it is simple. So I like that uh, we end there. Then we have another class as from two, uh, where we shall begin by looking at this topic uh, one. We shall continue from there on this topic one on assurance and um, assurance engagement. And unless if you have got any question, you can ask. There's a uh, Irene and Nancy. If you have got any question, you can ask. If there is none, then uh, we can meet at two for our next class. Do you have any question? Irene and Nancy. No question. Irene has got no question. Nancy? I also don't have a question. So, so we meet at uh, two. So as a topic uh, one. Now, here is a, uh, we can't write everything. <laughs> So maybe we shall be having a blend between the our self-taken notes and have here the handouts. We shall use the handouts where it is appropriate because of the time factor. If we start writing everything at Crazy Malisa, I do not you much time. So where it is appropriate for us, we shall be taking our own self-notes and have to put it in and that will be sent to you in advance. So, so, so enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Let's meet up. Too. Thank you, sir. Thank you.